joining us now. It's been a long time since I talked to him. My friend, the voice of the BYU Cougars, he's Greg Rubel on the drive on ESPN 700. Greg, how are you, man? Great, Spence. Good to speak with you again. I'm fond of you and your family, and uh, just so glad that uh, you're back and on the air, and I'm happy to be with you. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your time today. And before we get to football, Greg, we chatted with um, Jay Billis about a half hour ago, and he was awesome when it comes, and he always is, when it came to taking the NCAA to task for what they've done to Yoli. Nine games uh, for the senior who – unfortunately will miss a third of his senior season and everybody was so excited Greg when he decided to come back and it's not like the entire season is lost but man does it seem like a harsh punishment for a pretty minute slip up what are your thoughts yeah I think everyone in the BYU community expected a different outcome uh you know once the possibility was raised there could be some kind of sanctions I don't think they thought anything in the neighborhood of nine games and that's why Tom Homo he said was was so disappointed and and then Mark Mark Pope you know kind of uh, reiterating noting just how forthright and open and contrite Yoli was in the entire process to try to make things right. And uh, I'm sure that they had to have expected that because of how BYU approached it, uh, the sanctions would be, w- sanctions would be uh, less severe than they ended up being. But uh, you can tell it's, uh, it's a difficult transition time right now for the NCAA. They've already gone back and rescinded their, their agent certification rule, kind of underscoring, Spence, just how uh, uncertain this whole time is uh, as, as, as student-athletes explore their options professionally. Uh, Yoli did the exploration, thought he did the right things the right way, and it, as it turns out, some missteps were made. Does this change the scope of the season, in your opinion, Greg, because he'll miss the Maui? Uh, chances are he's going to miss the Utah game, and, and while it, you know, I think Mark has a, a good, talented squad on his hands, I think Yoli is his centerpiece, is his best player. Um, does the NCAA tournament, obviously they can go win their conference tourney, but is the NCAA tournament, in your mind, still a possibility for this group, even with their best player missing nine games? Well, the, the, the committee would, would certainly take into consideration the time that Yoli missed due to suspension if it stays nine games and he stays away for those nine games. But, but the ability to, to, to go win your league is, um, is uh, it, it's mitigated when you've got Gonzaga at the top of that league. And St. Mary's, a really strong team, too, right now. I think BYU, even with Yoli Childs, um, you know, might not be picked above either of those two teams, obviously. And, and, and that's where BYU's kind of been the last number of seasons. So it's, it's a hard league to win. It's been an impossible league to win for BYU since they joined it. And so the, non, uh, the non-conference resume... Which, uh, which could have been pretty substantial, you know, because of how that first month, month and a half shaped up for BYU. And again, the guys could really rally and surprise us, right? They could, uh, they, they, they could uh, uh, you know, come together and band together and, and be better than people expected. But uh, that said, it's going to be tough to, to maybe put as much non-conference weight uh, behind their resume as they hope to have, uh, have achieved in the first place. Last basketball question, Greg, and then we'll move on. I, I was always a big Dave Rose guy. I sent my kid to his camp for three straight years. Um, you're not going to meet a better person. And he, look, he's just an incredible head coach as well. I was sad to hear him. Uh, I was sad to hear that he was stepping aside. I was relieved that it wasn't health related. So now they have a new coach. Now you, BYU has a new new coach and Mark Pope, who I don't know all that well. Um, what have been your impressions since Mark and his staff has stepped on campus? Well, he always showed it during his first stint at BYU, but he had to show it in a different way, and that is the energy and enthusiasm and passion that he has today. As an assistant to Dave Rose. You kind of have to play your part, and and now as the head man, he's kind of unleashed, and, and that's in a positive sense. He's a very, very uh, positive and outgoing and forward-thinking and goal-minded individual, uh, loves to do what hasn't been done, think about things that haven't been thought. All those kinds of things are, are Mark Pope's M.O., so, uh, and, and I'm with you, too. I mean, uh, there, there's no bigger Dave Rose fan or booster than I am and, and, and hated to, in, in some ways to kind of see it end the way it did. I would have liked it to end on something uh, a little more uh, positive and successful uh, an end than than maybe BYU had last year. That said, uh, Mark will bring a lot of good things to the program, and I've been excited to uh, get to work with him so far and and, and kind of uh, find out what ideas he has in mind for this program. Greg Rubel is our guest. BYU-Utah, 16 days away. Going to be here before you know it. You know, Greg, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts on – um, just the dynamic of this game, not this specific game. We'll get to that momentarily. But, um, you know, it, it's it's a lightning rod when it comes to the conversation, and that's what makes it great. There are some people that don't love it. There's some people that think it's the best day on our sporting calendar. Two-part question, do you think this game should be played every year? The second part of the question is, do you like it being played as the first game of the year? 
Well, part one, yes. I, I think BYU and Utah is one of the great football rivalries in this country, and I'd hate to see it interrupted for even a season as it was in 2014. Yes, 2015 as well, but they played in the bowl game. So really just one year hiatus. And so, yes, I think it's got to be played every year because it is uh, part of college football history and this state's history. As for when it falls in the schedule, you have less control over that. And so I kind of accept it where it lies. I thought it was great to have it be the season ender. And there's a ton of intrigue involved with it being the first game of the season. I think the dynamics, though, Spence, differ for, for both opponents. Um, you know, regardless of the outcome, uh, Utah can then not so much rest up, but ramp up for USC, which I think is their conference opener, right? And and so they have some time between BYU and their Pac-12 schedule, and they're picked to win that league and go to the Rose Bowl. So that's their ultimate objective, win or lose against BYU. For BYU not being at a conference uh, and having this eight straight loss drought uh, you know, to Utah kind of hanging uh, o- over the head, the stakes are a little different, and you could argue a little higher. Uh, BYU is playing for different things, but but primarily they're playing to prove that uh, that they can they can make the plays needed to beat their rivals again, which hasn't happened in such a long time. And uh, you know, it's it's it, it's a game that if you, if you win, Utah can look at it and say, well, okay, now we're eight and one. We're not nine and zero. Oh, we're eight and one. We're going to move on and try and win the Pac-12. If BYU drops the game and, and say has nine straight losses, they've got to emotionally regroup to head across the country to play. Uh, in the SEC the next week against Tennessee. And that becomes the kind of game that Wisconsin was last year for BYU, where they had a disappointing home loss to Cal and then had a really nice bounce back and and really kind of showed their character by winning at Camp Randall. BYU would have to have a similar display of character if they don't come out victorious in week one. So a lot rides on week one in a lot of ways, but arguably spends more for BYU than for Utah. What, Greg, do you think gives BYU fans more confident this year that the outcome in a couple of weeks could be different than it has been over the last eight years? Uh, a year of growth for the offensive coordinator and the quarterback and the number of weapons he has around him. Um, and, and I think you could also maybe add, based on, on, on kind of uh, what Kalani and, and Jeff Grimes have been talking out in the offseason, the philosophical approach to the offense this year – uh, might be a little more explosive-minded, and I think that would be a positive thing. Ultimately, it was BYU's inability to put up enough points to finish off Utah last year. They capped at 27, and I don't think, Spence, since uh, BYU on the Beck to Harleen game defeated Utah 33-31, I don't think BYU's topped 28 points since in, in any of the Utah games, and, and that's kind of a very average number in college football right now. You've got to be above average, I think, to beat a team like Utah. The challenge is their defense is always so good, Getting up to even 28 is a challenge. That's why we've seen so many of these BYU-Utah games, you know, end up, um, you know, in the 24-21s, 20-13s, 19-13s, these, these lower scoring type of battles. Last year was, in a way, a bit of an outlier, getting up to 35-27. So that's ultimately going to be BYU's challenge, be a more explosive offense and show that in game one. Anytime, Greg, a, a young quarterback shows promise. I mean, look, in so many ways, for so long, BYU was – as much as quarterback you as any other school. And you know the list. Our listeners know the list. We don't need to talk about all of them with the Steve Youngs, the Jim McMahons, et cetera. And, and look, o- over that six-game sample size last year, I thought Zach was phenomenal. I know his family pretty well. I know he's been raised very well. And I'm not a quarterback's coach, but when I see him throw a football, I say that's the way it should look. Yep. So just how good do you think he can be if he maximizes his potential, all of it? Well, he, presuming he's going to be a, a, a four-year guy at BYU, and, and based on what he showed in just season one, uh, the expectations can be understandably high. But, but you know, Tanner Mangum had a really good freshman season, and, and things, you know, and, and it was different for him because he was giving up the job the next year. He kind of knew that if Taysom Hill was, was back and Taysom Hill was back, that, that Tanner would be stepping behind again. And that's not the case for Zach Wilson. Zach can, can think about progressing and springboarding year to year. But the numbers – and the style and the eyeballs tell you he could be a special quarterback here at BYU. And it's been a long time. In fact, it's never happened, Spence, that a quarterback at BYU has been the passing leader in both his freshman and his sophomore seasons. Zach would be the first to do that. So we are talking about uncharted territory if he has a special season because no one's ever done it as a freshman and a sophomore at BYU. Zach could be the first to have that kind of year. But the signs are all very promising. And I did some tweets about this yesterday. But, you know, since Max Hall, uh, BYU's had just one 3,000-yard passer. And that was Tanner Mangum in that great freshman season of his back in 2015. Um, you know, Zach has the kind of tools to, to make you think that they might approach that you know, plateau at least or territory again. He looks to be that good. 
Who's he going to hand the ball off to, Greg? I know there are a few guys down there they like, and um, I've seen uh, you know so, some tweets and some social interactions about uh, you know some some guys, Tyshawn, who had a good scrimmage. Is, is is there one guy that has taken the lead at the running back position? Well, it's a top trio, and Tyson's right there, along with Lopini Katoa and Emmanuel Asupa. Asupa and Tyson, of course, as uh, as fifth year grad transfers uh, from uh, South Carolina for Tyson and Rice for Emmanuel along with Lopini Katoa, a sophomore who led the team in touches last year, and he was very productive with those touches, had a great touchdown per touch rate as a freshman. I think among those three, you're going to find enough yards to get the job done for BYU, and you've got a Sione Finau and a Tyler, uh, Tyler Algier giving you some depth, but those top three are, are, are put BYU in a better spot than it certainly was at the end of last season. Taki Taki's in the NFL now, Greg, a big loss. He was quite a playmaker on that side of the football. Um, who are you looking for as far as playmakers at the linebacker spot? Well, uh, you know, those tackles don't get talked a lot, uh, talked about a lot as playmakers, but in their own particular way, they can be really impactful. And that, 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 that's why I look like a guy like, like Kyrus Tonga uh, inside. So up front, uh, Kyrus. Uh, on the corners, Diane Gonwoloku is the headline maker, but there really isn't anyone else yet to have established themselves as a playmaker. Diane is certainly that. He can score the ball on defense. He'll man a corner spot this year. At safety, Austin Lee is one guy you can count on. The other guy you're still trying to figure out. At linebacker, Isaiah Kofusi and Zane Anderson are the definite playmakers, but who will be the guy that fills the shoes of Shione Takitaki? That hasn't been answered yet through camp. So I think at each level of the defense, you can find a standout or two and then some gaps to be filled. It seems like every time... um... Somebody's down at BYU camp and posts some sort of update or, or some sort of opinion piece. They start with the offensive line. Are they going to be as good as advertised? Well, I think he feels good about the first group, uh, which would be right, you know, on most days, you know, Christensen, Longson, MP, Hodge, and Lachance uh, left to right. Some competition there at that right tackle spot between Harris, Lachance, and Chandon Herring. But there, you know, there's a good number of starts there uh, back in those, in those guys I just mentioned. Um, and, and, and they're still relatively young. Uh, they got a lot of starts as, as, as young players, so no one uh, of, the, of the four that are coming back are older than a sophomore right now. So, so they're good with room to grow, which is the positive thing for BYU. Greg, we'll end on this. Just a question about Kalani, a guy who I, I – just like Dave Rose, I've got a bit of a blind spot for Kalani. When, he's the, when he was the defensive coordinator at the University of Utah, I did a coach's show with him every week. I grew to really like him and, and care about him as a person – and I have so many family members that love BYU football. I get the question all the time, is Kalani the right guy? My response is, I hope that he is. My question to you is the same. Is Kalani the right guy, and has he made this his program now? Well, I, I, I believe, like you do, that he is the right guy. And that's why I want him to have as much success as possible, because I'd like him to stick around a long time. I love his style. I love his way of teaching. I love his way of, uh, of mentoring. Uh, I, love, I like the coaches he's hired around him. Uh, he enters the season with an overall winning record. I think if he can just stay in that territory, he'll be in good shape. The schedule's tough enough where folks have to realize that just getting to a bowl game is is an accomplishment with the kind of schedule BYU's put together. So just stay above 500, hopefully a few games, and then a few games more, and then a few games more, and make this a long-time tenure because he's a special guy. He's a BYU guy. He was a BYU fan before he was a BYU player, before he was a BYU coach. Um, and so I, I wish the best for him because uh, you get a lot of good feelings around him, and, and, and the players do too, and the players want to win for him. I hope it all comes together and keeps coming together. And if I could just amend an earlier thing I said about the offensive line, Spence, a couple of those guys are juniors, so they are getting a little older, but it's still a relatively young offensive line. Certainly. Greg, it's right around the corner, man, 16 days away, so enjoy a little bit more downtime. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll do it again. Be well, okay? Uh, Spence, ask anytime. Thank you. You got it. Greg Rubel, voice of the BYU Cougars.